Hi, I'm Liz. Um, I don't think you can really tell the story of how you use humor to shit all over politicians who hate abortion without giving you a backstory. <laughs> so my backstory was, as a kid, I just did not understand what it meant to be a little girl. And it felt like the tools they gave me to even have fun were anathema to fun. Um, it started out, I'll never forget when I got a baby doll for a gift, and it was a toy, and the trick and the toy and the fun part was you would give the doll a bottle, and the doll would pee, and you would change the diaper. <laughs> and after a couple times, you did that. And I was looking for something else I could do with the doll, and I realized through the small amount of science I understood that if you could give a doll a bottle and make it pee, you could also put the bottle where it peed and make it barf. <laughs> when I discovered this and went running into the dining room where my mother was ironing and said, look what I invented, and I'm squirting and the doll is barfing, my mom did not greet me as an innovator. <laughs> she first called the priest and then called a child psychologist. <laughs> but I just simply wanted to get my curiosity going, and it was really tough. And, and I went through a bunch of stuff, and I started, and then I, somebody dared me to be a stand-up comic, and they dared me because I was sort of the class cynic, and then when I looked around on TV, and I never saw any women stand-up comedians who were talking about what I was living. It was the early 1980s, I was a punk rock kid, I was angry, feminism was boring me, and I just saw wonderful women, Joan Rivers, Phyllis Diller, but that wasn't me. So I didn't know if I could even be a stand-up comedian as a woman. Um, but I saw George Carlin, and he hated the Catholicism I hated, and I was like, I can do that. I like that. So I talked a little bit about religion when I started doing stand-up, and I talked a little bit about the way women were treated in society, how they were portrayed in media. But I had kind of an awakening that changed my whole life um, in 1991, and I had moved to New York, and somebody set me up on a blind date. And I don't know why people did that. I have a guy for you. No, you don't. Why are we doing this? Um, but I was from Minnesota, so I was like, well, I'll go, because that's the right thing to do, right? Yeah, go. <laughs> so I called the guy, and I said, well, I just looked at the paper. It looks like La Dolce Vita is playing at the film forum, and I've never seen it on a big screen. Pause on the other end of the phone. He goes, isn't that in black and white? I was like, oh, but I gotta go, because I said I was gonna go. So we met in front of the film forum, and the dude is kind of my worst nightmare. <laughs> Yankees hat, satin Yankees jacket, Yankees wallet. <laughs> and I have a theory. I have a theory about men. If you meet a dude and he's wearing more than one piece of sports memorabilia, he probably won't go down on you. It's a, <laughs> I'm not sure, but I think it's true. So we watch the movie, I get the huge popcorn because I realize it's probably gonna be my dinner. <laughs> and he keeps falling asleep during the movie and sliding up and down me and I can't take it and I'm fighting my Midwestern niceness and I'm like, just deal. And finally, I just had like rage break and I took my greasy hand and I purposely woke him up so I could wreck his jacket. <laughs> and then I felt awful, which led to me going, let's have a drink after the movie. We go have a drink after the movie, and this is the night of the very first Gulf War. And it's on the TV at the bar. And it's the first night any of us watched a war transpire in our living rooms, in our bars, and there was a theme song and graphics and really attractive people replaced the people on CNN. And 
as I was watching this, I wasn't trying to be smart. I wasn't trying to be interesting. But I just thought to myself as I took in all of the way they were reporting, are they actually reporting on a war or trying to sell me a war? And I was like, and then the guy goes, this is so awesome. <laughs> and I was like, I got my answer. And it literally changed the way I wrote my jokes. It changed the way I cared about anything. It, I started researching. I, my comedy became about the political landscape, but even more about the media and their responsibility to us. And I would go to theaters. 20 people would come to my shows. I would do one-woman shows. It wasn't really working. And then I did a special on Comedy Central in a contained group put out to the world, and it went great. And then Comedy Central said, hey, we want to do a show that responds to the world. Do you want to do it? And I was like, I've never done a show. And they're like, that's fine. I'm like, this is a bad idea, but OK. Um, and I said, the one thing I ask is, can we do a show where the media is the character? And they said, what does that mean? I said, let's just play it straight. If the sound is down, it looks like a news show. When the sound is up, it's shitting all over the news. They were like, OK. So. The Daily Show was born. And it was incredible to be able to bring people information. And it was also terrifying that people got so reliant on the comedy show to give them their information. <laughs> but the part that was unsatisfying for me was I could get people mad, but I couldn't say, and this is what you need to do. And so I left the show. I launched Air America Radio, which was a crazy experiment in just fun and also just what happens when you're living in a Vanity Fair article where someone is not funding you. Um, <laughs> and then I was like, I don't know what to do. So I decided I would write a book. And I left Brooklyn to go write my book. And I drove across country with my dogs. And it was right when that Tea Party Congress took over. And it was literally, people are drowning in their home mortgages. They have nothing. They're freaking out. The economy is about to collapse. And on the first day of that new Congress, a congressman named Mike Pence stands on the floor, HR1, very first bill, and says, I want to defund Planned Parenthood, the national parks, and public media. And I'm like, are they performing abortions on Car Talk in Yosemite? Did I miss something in there? Because, like, I love abortion, but even that seems kind of, I don't know. <laughs> Turns out they weren't. <laughs> Turns out it failed. But what happened was, within three months, 27 state legislatures put into law, or tried to put into law, these horrible, horrible trap laws that were preventing women from getting access to abortion. And I was sitting in Minnesota, trying to finish my book, feeling like I need to do something. I don't know what to do. I finished my book, and I was like, well, I have to get back to Brooklyn. So what if I call up Planned Parenthood, and I drive across country, and I do benefits along the way? And so I call up Planned Parenthood, and I said, hi, i got to drive back to Brooklyn with my two dogs and a van. I'd like to do some benefits for you. And they're like, who are you? And I'm like, no, it's a super good idea. So I did. I st what started at 6, I actually just yesterday came late because I did my 95th benefit for clinics around the country. Don't clap. It's fine. No. There's no, no reason to clap. There's not enough time for that. Um, <laughs> but I realized three things happened on all, of these, uh, on all of these events. The people who came to see my comedy didn't really know what was happening with the erosion of the clinics. The people who came to support that actual clinic didn't understand the bigger picture. But the thing that motivated me to my next project was the fact that either the receptionist, the, the, the provider, or the physician said, said to me, thanks for coming. No one ever comes. And I just thought, man, I used Planned Parenthood. I had an abortion at 16. 
I am where I am because somebody gave me the chance to do that. I know way too many creative people who could be the people that come. And so I decided I'm not going to allow healthcare providers to be the fact checker and the, uh, the person who has to defend what they do and the provider. So I went back to New York and I had a bunch of people over. I had a big chili dinner. I, I called up anybody I knew that was in comedy production and I said, I want to do two things. The media isn't covering this issue, so I want to do super provocative videos that uses language, that uses all the things that they can't say, and then I want to hit the road and I want to be able to take us and turn us into part comedy tour, part USO show, and part Habitats for Humanity. So for the past three years, Lady Parts Justice, here, oh yeah, there's a button, is it that one? Oh yeah, Lady Parts Justice. <laughs> has been doing just that. We've made over 150 videos. We've been to Mississippi, Alabama, uh, Kentucky, and we, in, in, uh, in uh, tandem with the clinics, we find out what they need. So we have either shown them parties, we've done their laundry, we've walked their dogs, we've done their gardening. We're going to Texas uh, at the end of November to build a fence around the clinic because they can't get a contractor to do it. And then we do a comedy show that brings the whole community together so that when we leave, the community comes to the show, they meet the clinic, and they provide and promise to be this emotional support for the clinics so that the clinics know that they are loved and that they are supported and that the community has their back. Um, it's really important for me to say to you and to this work, we need people on the ground. You need bodies to be with people who are doing this work so that they can feel a tangible emotional connection and that they understand their work values. They go through a gauntlet of assholes, they leave through a gauntlet of assholes, Oftentimes their legislators are a gauntlet of assholes and their family members. So they need that support. And so we provide it. And it's been incredibly great to do the videos. And last year we did a great piece of technology where we're constantly figuring out how do we reach people who are need these services and then we want them to give back. And it's really not TV anymore. You can make videos, but it's like, how can we do an app? Where are people? On, and it's like, how about if we go to a place where people are actually hooking up? You know, it's like you barely want to be with Mr. Right. It's sometimes not even Mr. Right now or Mr. for the next 20 minutes. It's like if you're on Tinder, you're like, uh, yep, and then we're done. So we made an app that's called Hinder. Um, it's just like Tinder. But you can you scroll through, you can click on your state, and you can see the state legislators who have proposed or passed legislation. You can share it with on Facebook and Twitter. Um, and you can click on links that fact check everything in the app. So I don't have, you can download it. It's on all the whatever, Googles and whatever. It's in the places. Um, <laughs> it's in all the places. Um, so then we decided, I just wanted people to get to know who we are. So instead of me carrying on about what we do, I have a short video to play to show you a little bit more about what we do and so that you can feel the impact and how the providers feel about what we do. One in three women will have an abortion in her lifetime. I'm one of them. And quite frankly, I just got sick of all these creepy defundamentalists driving the narrative. We have the, the gates of hell right here. I mean, we, we have an actual a line between death and life. And you know what? I'm not afraid to say I had an abortion. And I also feel like I owe it to every single person who needs one to fight to make sure they can get one. Lady Parts Justice League was put together by Liz Winstead. She is a co-creator of The Daily Show, and she's a political comedian and, and a genius, and she just cares. I basically made a career out of using humor to shine a light on bullshit. And what this movement needs is a jolt of provocative messaging to expose these creepy self-appointed vaginal crossing guards. 
So I get some of my funny friends together, writers, comedians, activists, to make hilarious videos and do live events so we can drop info about the erosion of all this reproductive access into pop culture spaces. We're doing something completely different that people aren't used to. The content that we're producing is making more people familiar with what's going on. What better way to do that than to also make you laugh? It's not that millennials don't care about these issues, it's just that the message being given to them was not effective. But we don't want to be just some kind of anger fluffers. So we started an event where people could take action called V to Shining V. V to Shining V. Ah! Plan your V to V party. V to Shining V. People gather right before an election to talk about what is at stake in every single state in the union. Combine that with some music, some comedy, some facts, and a call to action so that we are in control of the narrative. One of the most important and fun and meaningful things that we get to do is just pile into a van together and travel across the country to show support to the clinic providers. We'll do a stand-up show, we'll do workshops, we'll do the grunt work, we'll escort patients, we'll take them grocery shopping, we'll cook for them. We'll do anything to let them know that we value them and their work. To have our peers and to have you know other people in this movement recognize what we're doing, you guys appreciate us and appreciate what we go through. It just, it means a lot. We just feel like, you know, we've all used these clinics. Don't you think we should be defending them? It made a huge difference because for me personally as a provider, having to come through a throng of folk who called me a murderer, accused me of harming, quote, my own race or black people. The love that I felt and the support that I felt has been amplified by the related parts of Justice League being on the ground. But to have come that far and to have spent your time and your money and your energy and walked into hell. <laughs> you walked into hell and I am so great. When you all showed up, I was reminded of something that Dr. King said. If America collapses, it won't be from the appalling actions of the evil people. It'll be the appalling silence of the good people. So if you're sitting there not with the first person you had sex with, <laughs> it's probably because you used birth control. <laughs> maybe because you had an abortion. So if that's the case, maybe you should join us. It's mom. We drink and we have shirts. Join the Lady Parts Justice League, exposing sexism. That's it. I'm around. Talk to me if you want to join us. Thank you. Thank you.